Hello, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to this season five of the Legends podcast with me, Sarah Faruya from Sarah Faruya Coaching. And this theme this season is very fucking creative. And I am so delighted to have an old friend of mine here who we did some wild, wild projects back in the mid 2010s together, <laughs> going from UK to um to Japan. And that is Zoe Cobb. Welcome, Zoe. Thank you. Hello, Sarah. I'm, I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. And you're you're calling in from Italy, right? Yeah, we're in Milan right now. Milan, how wonderful. <laughs> and so, you know, the way that I um I view the world is that there are many ways to lead a life and everybody has stories. And Zoe, before we kick off, I want to ask you this question. Can you tell me a story that has had an impact or some kind of influence on you? I think, yes, I certainly can. I think <laughs> I will start with, there's a story, there was a movie that came out, I think it was even Disney, um, called Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. Mm-hmm. And um, when I was a young, young girl, I watched this um, with my dad. And at that, at that stage, um, I had my own horse. And this idea of wild hearts can't be broken was just a bit of a, became a bit of a fantasy for me for a long time. Um, and it's a story of a young girl who sees this act where they go, the horse goes up, up, up a ramp really, really high. And the rider's on it and they jump off the, the end into water. And funnily enough, there's also the theme of the male, female, because she was, there was always a man. And then she went and met this sort of, it ended up like a bit of a circus troupe. And she convinced them that she could do it. So she went up and, and um, jumped these horses off this giant kind of crane-like structure mm -hmm. into the water. And she, she, she ran away with the circus. And that's always had a sort of a really, a, it took really deep root in my soul. I love that. I loved that story as a young girl. And it had... It kind of, it had already glimpses of my life as it, as it was with my fantasies with the horses and, um, you know, what, what it could, what it could mean to, to live a life like, like that show person with horses, you know, there was this like show person with horses. What yeah. was that? What was that deep root? Do you think, what was the deep root that took hold there? It was the feeling of doing something um, seemingly impossible, something unexpected, but something just like the richness of what the world can provide, you know, like the richness of the opportunities that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, you go searching for them or they land on your, you, you know, your doorstep or in my case, you know, hitchhiking, jumping, jumping the circus wagon. Just, yeah, just the richness of what can happen in life. And, and, and as your, you know, your stories are, and every life, you know, the, the different ways that we can live these lives, you know. And live so many within one lifetime as well, right? <laughs> what did it give you a glimpse of? Courage, risk, mm. um, possibility of kind of expecting the unexpected and thrill. Just thrill. <laughs> just like... Oh, I've just got goosebumps all over my body. <laughs> thrill. <laughs> Yes. I love it. Oh, I could yeah. do a bit of this courage, risk, possibility, expect the unexpected and thrill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're present with us now. And also present with us is one of your um, children, right? Yeah. So <laughs> how nice that we've got a little, a little imagination machine next sitting next to us there. <laughs> Hello. 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 So Hello. it's going to be a little bit of cooing and uh, and laughing in the background there, and that's because our little little friend is with us. No, okay. It's only with cooing and laughing. <laughs> She's a happy wee one. She is. So absolutely beautiful love that so wild hearts can't be broken maybe i'll try and watch that sometime is it an oldie oldie or is it like from the 70s or 80s i would guess 70s or 80s i don't i, I don't know i could don't remember either. okay no problem um, i will check that after this so wild like predictable disney style okay so the music will give you a cue right <laughs> what, what's <laughs> happening next <laughs> brilliant but that's still wildly creative every film set is wildly creative so 
I'm going to give you your creative bio now, Zoe. So please sit back and be uh, amazed by yourself. <laughs> so Zoe has a background in physical theater, group development, circus, yoga, and dance. Academically, she trained at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama with a master's in movement direction, and previously in Canada with a BA in theater and modern languages. She has expanded her training with the Thomas Richards and Grotowski Work Center. National Circus School, Moscow State Circus, Five Rhythms and Contact Improv. She created and directed dance theatre with her company Artful Badger in England for the last 10 years. She has delivered workshops internationally in Japan, hi, USA, Italy, France, Germany, UK and UAE. She has led group trainings for the last five years in the corporate theatre and educational worlds, and she currently teaches aerial yoga and circus skills in Italy while continuing to deliver development workshops around Europe. Amazing. We also have May Sawada, who is um, hoping to join the Cirque du Soleil, who is also uh, aerial. Uh, uh, she does the silks and aerials, uh, who is my previous guest on the podcast so for anybody who's interested go back and listen to May she's 18. So Zoe works with personal and group development through somatic or kinesthetic approach her unique revealing work is a combination of practicing physical theater circus nutritional studies and energy healing she has worked with executive corporate leadership and development internationally for three years, specializing in situational leadership, self-organization, masculine, feminine balancing, and she continues to direct and perform in artistic projects. Wow. <laughs> and we met on one of her kind of corporate slash creative um, endeavors, um, which went ahead back in 2015, 2016 time. So, wow, Zoe, so, 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 uh, I always caught thought of you as a dancer, but actually it's way more than that, isn't it? It's a movement specialist, perhaps. I don't know. How do you, or do you just not bother labeling yourself? Well, to be honest, in the past few years, I haven't labeled myself, but movement specialist is definitely what I went with a while ago. Uh -huh. um, because first of all, I've had so many trainings uh, personally that, that have, you know, in my body, but then also just working with really different, a whole different scale of artists or or people that need different styles of movement, different styles of dance as a, as a choreographer, as a, as a movement trainer. So there's, and, and then also just movement of the daily body in the daily life, you know, so there's that side of it as well. Lovely. So Zoe, I'm really interested in understanding people's journeys to where they are now. So I'd love to hear about what's your background, your, your ancestry and your, what was your childhood like? My background, my ancestry. So my mother comes from an Italian Irish family mm -hmm. that moved to Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, my little pterodactyl. Um, <laughs> that moved to Canada three generations ago, mm -hmm. and they lived as at that point sort of post-war kind of shameful Italians in in Canada, and they all they all kind of hid their language, and so the languages were lost quite quickly. And then so. Yeah, so her father did various jobs, was very creative with his work as well. He did like, he, he was, um, he ran a bowling alley and then he was an insurance broker. And then he, like, there were many different kind of um, parts to his, his career while her mum was a housewife and did the, ex, you know, lots and lots and lots of work of keeping the house together and three kids going, which now I'm appreciating. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you are. Now you've got your two. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then my father's side comes from really quite originally Northern England, which is, I, I always claim my Viking roots from that side. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they came down into South England. Um, and my, my grandfather was a colonel in the military and my, my grandmother was a very creative. In fact, when I listen to other people, um, talking about her and she had a lot of power and in and in a lot of creativity and in many respects a bit frustrating for her as that the the era that she lived in because she didn't have many channels to, to put it into so but she she did she found she was, she was an incredible investor she invested in she was basically responsible for taking our family to a, a, a much more comfortable place and she she was she was paint she was a painter she painted as well Mm. Um, 
but not avidly, but just I still have a really lovely swan painting she did. Mm. My grandmother, Gan, and my grandfather was a very fastidious. Um, he drew, he was a cartographer, and he drew and detailed the most complete collection of all the train train lines and everything on the island so on england on the Eng, on the british isles so mm-hmm. on the whole of the island oh many islands sort of like this huge tomb of a, of a book of when the train line opened who opened it when it closed when it changed like every detail you could possibly imagine and was one of the oldest recipients of a phd from cambridge which was quite an event for the family wow uh, yeah um so that's my grandpa cobb and then my parents they both found each other in canada um dad went over for military training and in um, medicine hat and then found uh found my mum ski patrolling (laughs) um so they were on the on the slopes and married had three kids dad's also got a creative streak that was kind of banged out of him through English boarding school and military training, went into property management and property development. And, and mum um, actually did, I remember as a child had strayed, changed bouts of, I, I think partially got my costume passion from her. Um, she would go out in a clown costume and go and sing at kids' birthday parties, which I totally forget was part of our lives. But I, there were moments when I just remember like, I found also my mum's old wig and I was like, of course. <laughs> Legend. <laughs> dress up and go um go and sing at kids birthday parties so there's a side of me that's definitely connected to that as well oh yeah I can really see that actually as you say that but what a legend it's just so funny the things you remember isn't it I think my mum and dad are both frustrated artists as well and my granddad you know my mum's a real crafter but she made beautiful clothes and patchwork and she still to this day crafts and has like a craft sensei and my dad loves photography and music and stuff like that so and my granddad painted and he did marketry but none none of them for for their living just Mm -hmm. You know, it was one of those things that was there. It's just, it's funny how, I don't know, in this day and age, it seems to have become so kind of commodified in a way where you're supposed to make a living out of it. But then it was just called an interest or I suppose a hobby or something like that. It was just something you did. It was integral to your life (laughs) and and clowning (laughs) at kids' birthday parties. Yeah. How brilliant. And what do you think the influence they had on you was? I remember really strongly having having left education. Like my, my parents gave me a very uh, a great education um, uh, at a school that allowed us to go out into the mountains, allowed us to do all kinds of things. We had small classes. It was really really lucky. Lots of creativity, and yeah. um, I just felt like they gave me the uh, anything's possible. Um, one second, I'm just gonna touch baby. Okay. <laughs> I'm all for um, I'm all for uh, letting the babies be there and letting them be with you and on you and everything as part of the podcast. So please go I on. Mean, <laughs> of course, you know anything's possible. I remember really speaking to my father after I graduated, and he said, "So, so what are you going to do?" And you know, I was going in heading into theatre and modern languages. So, what are you going to do with that? And he was, you know, he was very concerned with how I would apply and how I would make money and how I would, you know. And I just remember responding, I don't know, I'll design shoes for this company and then I'll go and um, fly and do, like, I just remember having a really, like, really flippant, but also really colorful response. Now yeah. I think of a really cheeky, kind of a little bit spoiled daughter, but just possibility. My, my parents definitely gave me possibility. Yeah. That's great. And so then where were you raised? Were you raised in Canada or in Britain? And I think you moved around a bit, didn't you? Yeah. Tell us about that. Um, So dad went out of the military quite soon, but I think still had quite a strong element of his lifestyle involved with that. So we were in Canada and then we had a beautiful farm outside near the mountains. And then we went down to California because he from the army had a had a polo playing habit. Mm -hmm. So we went down and um, played polo in California for a while and then we moved to England where his family was and where I spent a lot of time with my cousins and have really great memories of my English years. We started school there and then finally my mum just said look I need to go back to Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, so we packed up when I was and, and do you know what I started the the Royal Ballet there. What? And I 
loved it. I was yeah. in the ballet schools and I just, it was really my heart and soul. I remember finding my slippers and my book that my mom gave me and just bursting out and bursting into tears because it was a really big part of my life and it was really hard to leave that when, I, mm. when we went to Canada. In fact, I went into kind of a weird depression at, at nine years old when we moved back to Canada and tried to find my dance school again and just didn't exist, to, didn't exist. And so then I went into gymnastics instead to try and search somewhere else, which was another actually very useful education for me. And then ended up in theatre. So then, then after that, we basically stayed in Canada until I was... 17 and I decided I finished school at 17 and I decided that I wanted to see the world and I had saved up um grooming polo ponies uh wow. to save to to save the world I wish. <laughs> Freudian slip my dear Freudian slip which part of Canada were you in by the way um outside of Calgary so near the mountains on the west side mm -hmm. it's a real cowgirl country mm -hmm. uh, which informed a lot of my my upbringing and then traveled around the world. So I spent a year, a sort of what would be called a gap year, um, traveling. I started in Australia, New Zealand, Nepal, India, and then traveled through Europe. I got ridiculously ill. I had real, I had probably like a, a trauma awakening that coincided with the time that my parents were in court deciding quite difficult things between them and, and about us. Um, and I ended up really just landing, <laughs> sitting next to a llama. Um, he decided that um, that I needed to sit next to him in the in the in the teachings, and and just really had a very privileged look into Tibetan Buddhism in in Nepal in Kathmandu, mm. sitting next to the halls of all the long trumpets and the monks drinking yak butter and reciting mantras from their little books and sitting at the table and I was certainly the only woman and definitely the only white person in in this hall for for a month it's one of those sort of puzzling experiences that just lands on your lap um not really understanding why or how or um and then at the end of it he said okay now you need to go home and and make peace with this situation which I had never recounted anything. It's sort of it's a bit of a mystical encounter that I had there. Um, um, I never recounted anything to him about my family situation, but he said he said, "Okay, now you need to go home." <laughs> so um, I left Nepal, traveling on my own through through India. At um, I just turned eighteen and ended up finding a few different meditation paths, and that was a really it was a really big year for me. It it changed a lot for me. And, like and processed quite a big trauma, what I seem to understand now. Ah, yeah, yeah, we've, we've got that language available to us now. Then we didn't really have then, did we? No. But um, that's really fascinating. And this this mystical experience you had where you're like this inexplicable invitation <laughs> to this Lama and just sit with him with those massive trumpets in Tibet. How fascinating. What was the influence of that story on you? Again, deepening this path of anything's possible, like wow. literally just the unexpected, expecting the unexpected, just, you know, dropping. Life has so many possibilities. And, um, you know, I don't know what I think about destiny or predestination or any of those, those chats. Um, I tend to avoid them, but these quite extraordinary experiences can happen without you searching them or maybe you're searching them on a deeper level you don't know you're searching them i don't know how how in any any of that works it widened the 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 scale of possible it widened the scale of possible i love that and i i, I want to honor how humble you are about this as well you're like i had a mystical experience and <laughs> you know i don't know how i feel about destiny or predestiny um i find i mean that to me perhaps is one of the reasons why you and I connected so so well is because I don't know what I mean I, I love mystical magical experiences but I also most certainly do not want you to imagine I'm some kind of guru with some <laughs> with some kind of with some kind of magical wisdom for you or something like that does that make sense yeah yeah um Destiny and predestiny. Can you just tell me what it is where you're like, I don't really think about what, what is it? What's about, what is it about that? 
Um, I don't know. I've had, I mean, my, for example, my mother-in-law here is really into your, what your destiny is. And, you know, my mother was a teacher and she's a teacher and I've ended up spending a lot of my time and, and gaining a lot of my, my income now by teaching. And she said, you know, her discussion was, oh, it's all about destiny. And I don't know. I think, um, I think we, li we, we have the possibility to, min to live many lives in the life we're living. And I think maybe my acting or maybe studying of actors made me um, look at how many sort of versions of ourself there are in ourselves, you know, if you will, like how many parts of ourselves we can tap into if we choose to or not choose to or kind of where we take ourselves is um is one of the possibilities i just think it's really endless of what the resources of the human experience are if you want like how how far we can how many different yeah how many different parts of ourselves i think we can we can experience or, or maybe that's that's too selfish in a way but how many different parts of the human experience we have in in within our our, our capacity i you know that actually makes me relax a bit because Honestly, I've been feeling a bit stuck in a rut recently and a little bit I mean, <laughs> surprised. We've just had, we're in a two year and two and a half year pandemic. So we literally are stuck in a rut, but, um, or have been coming out of it now. But um, that idea that there's, there's all these different selves we can access just as part of the human experience, not as something outside well all all things of the human experience or something that needs to be managed or medicated it's just mm. it's so relaxing to me it's mm -hmm. it makes me feel oh thank god thank you for reminding me of that zoe mm. thank you mm. <laughs> so what happens next then after this you go home you, you make your peace what happens next then i went off to university on the east coast to study and i decided to study languages and um and east coast theater. of canada or america uh, on the east coast of canada yeah in a place called new brunswick um okay. near halifax yes and um i chose to study languages and theater because i watched the vim vendors film <gasps> called wings of desire yeah and they have all those beautiful languages mostly european languages in it but the languages in it it's like i want to understand those and then there's this one scene um that is also always remain part of my um psyche which is this the the, the trapeze artist and it's just been such like that whole you know there are angels that are on the yeah you know, it's just the whole story is really that's another one of those those landmark stories in my life uh so i chose fairly flippantly to study languages based on an evening of watching that film with one of my like really good friends at that moment and um traveled across the country basically to get as far away from honestly now when I look at it as far away from my parents situation as possible uh, through myself across the country yeah and um, which is literally farther than it is from here from Europe to, to, to Canada so it's a really good distance in Canada yeah it's huge I think people forget how well I, well I certainly forget especially little island people like myself we forget how vast places like Canada Australia America Asia Russia are you know it's amazing. Mm. Um, so you studied your languages and then so and then this takes you, I suppose, into your mid 20s, early 20s. And I did my I did three exchange programs because I was in a liberal arts university where I could design my own programs. So I went into uh, France for a year, Germany for almost a year and then wow. Spain for about half a year. And uh, did some languages and then did theater in each one of those countries. And then graduated with my Bachelor of Arts. And then um, and then I took a year, we left the university hitchhiking with my boyfriend at the time. And that, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but it was up through Eastern Canada, which was actually quite friendly, friend, hitchhiker friendly mm -hmm. um, at that moment. And we joined the circus. <laughs> you joined the circus? Yeah, well, I had two, two very important encounters. I, I found... We, we started hitchhiking with this uh, number 11 theater company, mm -hmm. um, which was a, an offshoot of Grotowski, Grotowski's training. So um, Jerzy Grotowski was an, a Polish theater director and had really, a, really strong, strong training methods, really unorthodox training methods, which is probably not to be, not, you know, to be expected out of a, 
uh, a fringe Polish director, but um, <laughs> ended up becoming uh, really fascinated with his type of theater, which was very transformative. Yeah, very transformative for the person at the same time as as training you as an as an actor or as a performer. And they took me under their wing for a while. We traveled with them. Um, and then I chose actually eventually to go back with them and spend some more time with them um, later. But then after that um, encounter, where they would spend loads of time together, they spend a year together working on one show and um, and each one of them would learn a new skill. So a new instrument or a, or a new like stilt walking or um, the accordion or um, learn a language for the show. So their character would, would come to life through this new skill. Um, just so much integrity and so much respect for those processes that take so much time and very little, it just is a dedication of life really that kind of working. Mm -hmm. The next person we got picked up with was literally the Moscow State Circus. So that was another turning point in my life. <laughs> I mean, what just got picked up by, I mean, what were they just passing by and you, oh, what, literally, that's what literally, happened. Literally, hitchhiking, oh, yeah. <laughs> so good. That's kind of mystical as well. <laughs> it's like yeah. uh, the Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, these kind of people, yeah. these things showing up for you, amazing. Dedication, integrity, process. That's what I'm taking from this part here. So you got picked up by, by the Moscow Circus and then what happens next? I don't even know if I want to ask. Amazing. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Oh, yeah, it's really, really precious. <laughs> um, so then my boyfriend at the time was like, yes, let's do it. And I was like, no, I'm not into this. This guy, this guy, like the guy who picked us up was doing the posters at the beginning. He was a bit creepy for me and I really yeah. wasn't into it. Um, and my boyfriend at the time was like, yeah, this is a brilliant experience. Experience. let's go for it so I, I I he convinced me we went um I started selling cotton candy at their next performance so I had a little cotton candy stall <laughs> um yeah exactly and made like just went to town with it just made so much money it was just a, a it, it spoiled my working um ethic because it was just such easy money to, to sell cotton candy and got introduced to a really intense kind of old school wolf pack culture where the men would pr protect these huge circus men like it was a, a circus made up at that point of uh, a Mexican side of the, the family and then a Russian side um, and the men were just really properly big 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 men um, and they would protect the women in the family and then the kids and and I had a an astrophysicist geek as my boyfriend that just was like almost the same size as me and definitely skinnier, and so didn't have the protection that would have been necessary. So the boss literally took me under his wing um, after you know a few attempts at my at my safety from other other uh, wolves um, and. Uh, and so he gave us a special place to sleep, which was, you know, there's there are lo lots and lots of stories there. It was it was it was it was very difficult to be there because we lived in the little caravan that always um, traveled every night, a new place to to set up the next day. Um, there was there was a fair amount of aggression. But then one of the high high rope performers came down and left, um, and they offered. They asked me if I had any training. I said, well, I've done gymnastics and ballet. And then they took me on and trained me every morning and night. I had this, the grandfather of the Mexican side called Hector, uh, trained me every morning and every night. And I had just a really quick <laughs> training to throw me up on the, it's called the Spanish web, which is a rope. Um, and there's a loop at the top and you either go in with, your wrist or you go in with your ankle and that someone at the bottom spins you round. So you make these shapes that kind of get spun round in, in space, um, in the air. And I had a really uh, initiation of fire to, to go up on that. And then um, we had, which was just literally a dream for me. It was really, I, you know, I can, I can just remember being just so, so happy even though we were living in this like smoke hut because the the boss just constantly chain smoked and we had our bed on the 
top bunk and it was just disgusting. We were eating out of tin cans and like doing anything we could j just, you know, just, just really cheap living to get by. We'd go to the, to the bank, literally with a bag full of coins, um, from the, <laughs> um, you know, savings for, for the next, next leg of the, of the post-graduation adventure. And, um, and so now he wanted to leave because he didn't, he didn't have much respect from all the big honchos who was setting up the circus every night and pulling it down. And I was getting to perform and, uh, we crossed the border going into America and basically the circus fell apart because there were some felons in the circus. And so the police came and pulled it all apart. There's lots of really, really good stories. Um, wow. That was an adventure. <laughs> and, and nine 11 had just happened. Oh my. And so my mom was like, get out of America. She was really panicking and, um, and really panicking for the company I was keeping. And, you know, I just couldn't keep it at bay anymore. So he wanted to leave and, and we left. Very good. And so would you say that on those, on those ropes there on the Spanish web, was that like a peak experience for you? Was that like a, you know, I was talking last night about when I used to sing in a choir and how it felt like I was going to take off sometimes because I was just so in it. It's like oh. such a peak experience. Was that what it was like for you? The way you were describing it there, it felt like it. Yeah, it was a real like, I mean, I don't know how, I don't know if you can say it, but it did feel like a soul encounter. Like it was just yeah. like a, like, I think I probably, and I've had, you know, some, again, I, I'm, I'm, my life is full of these strange encounters with psychics and weirdos that come up to me, weirdos, whatever a weirdo is. Uh, that's why uh, I hi. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, me too. <laughs> I qualify. Um, I was working in a health food store and she came up to me, uh, you know, she didn't buy anything and she just said, you're a gypsy heart and you should be uh, in, a, in a circus traveling. And this was, um, this was years before that had happened. So there's something, you know, it was a really strong experience. I loved it. I loved that. Wow. Loved it. Wow. Well, okay. So three words to take away from your circus experiences. What would be your uh, three kind of words that you would take away from that? That's a good question. Uh, thrill. Thrill. Just, I don't know, joy. Uh-huh. And ha hard work. Oh, thrill, joy, and hard work. Love it. It's very, very tough. Right. Wow. I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, you don't just get on a on a rope and start spinning around do you no there were a lot of tears, <laughs> I a lot of tears. <laughs> so let's take us through the next 10 years then um and then we then i decided to i needed i wanted to study more and i sort of put the nets out in various places and had my english side of the family um in london so i applied to a few places in london and it took me with my boyfriend at the time, who was also English and also applied in London. Um, we moved over to London to, for me, I got into the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama and he got into Goldsmiths. Oh, yeah. And um, we both started uh, student life there, started nannying to keep it together and um, and had my family. So a lot of my cousins that were kind of like my brothers and sisters really uh, around me, which was really great. I loved it. Fairly traditional education with them. Um, and then fantastic though, really, I wanted it to be more performance heavy, but it was much more direction heavy, which actually served me better because I was already, when was that? That was 2007, 2006, yeah. 2007. Came out of that with some good qualifications, had some work at the National Theatre, had some work at um, other big repertory theatres around London. Um, was that acting or dancing? Do you know, uh, choreography, basically. Ah, uh, choreography, yeah. But what in England is called movement direction, okay. um, that is a bit of a head of a head of the the wave. Because, if, for example, in Italy, so if you say movement direction, people really don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Uh, so it's choreography, but it can be choreography from anything. From one of my favorite jobs and one that I quote quite a lot was a story about an autistic boy who had an obsession with cats and he um, just wanted to be a cat. So through the, the performance, his, his physicality had to transform slowly into uh, a feline 
on on all fours. So um, that was a brilliant job. Just how to how to drop in these like you know feline moments um, <laughs> that uh, that could allow him to slowly transform entirely into a cat. Yeah, um, that was good. And through that, actually during that time in university, I met um, Five of Them's Dance which I just, just did every, I did literally did it every day. Um, cause in London, there were courses all over London, um, for a few years and then sort of slowed down to once a week, but really found my community there and got invited by one of my, f uh, now friends to go and dance at, at one of the festivals. And then Charlotte Tiley enters here. She was at the festival and she had made these animal masks and she gave me really by chance she i didn't really know who she was at all but i was around and she gave me this owl mask um which was actually always my mum's spirit animal we always had loads of little owls around the house so that was also another quite um quite a magical moment and the owls really stayed with me uh since in fact i have my last owl mask in the house here and there's an artist here who's saw the owl mask and he's kind of heard a bit of my history and now he's He's making me, he's so good at it. And he's making me a big owl mask. I'm so excited. Oh, wow. So I think this is just a great point to kind of move into when you came to Japan and that whole project we did together. And I just want to give a little bit of background. So you mentioned um, Charlotte. What's her surname? Charlotte Tiley yeah. is, her, is her maiden name. Okay. All right. So I knew her as Charlotte Dillon. So Dillon. Yeah, Dillon. that was her former married name I think so yeah. she is this incredibly talented mask maker and you know I didn't even really know that was a thing I still have my mask downstairs mm -hmm. um, that I made with her but she makes these incredible um, animal masks and and such and the marriage of the animal masks and your physicality and I mean there's one of my favorite videos I'll try I'll find it and we'll link it below is um of you walk going around this festival and you're dressed in these little kind of gold hot pants or something with a mask <laughs> on and kind of just walking around like animals and just weaving through the festival and stuff like that and i believe that's all is this all connected to artful badger as well perhaps we can kind of and we did this six month leadership journey for women together which was marrying kind of a, a cor corporate training coaching movements um some kind of energy work and also uh dance um, and taking these kind of 12 women from all kinds of backgrounds from you know like from you from your kind of um for example goldman sachs style things to to other movement entrepreneurs to um you know translators all different women through this amazing and we still keep in touch actually mm -hmm. through this incredible program it was really really interesting six month journey program with lots and lots of different elements mm -hmm. and um so we were part of the first kind of element of that um back in 2015 i think somewhere around there it was a very kind of creative i mean obviously all your periods have been creative but it's creative in a different kind of way i think uh, because that mm -hmm. was your doorway into corporate training, maybe. I'm not sure. or yeah. to, I, I'm not sure if that was. But um, I just want to hear a bit more about that. So all these festivals and all that. Because it was just so, like, so wildly creative, the Artful Badger stuff. For me, when I look at that, it just makes my heart sing. To, to see it and to feel it and to think about it and to just to think about all the stuff that goes in it. And the owl performance that you did as well. Was that on a hoop? Yeah. <laughs> so no, uh, like a sling. Sorry, a sling. a sling. Okay, so those like this gorgeous. Again, I think that was another Charlotte one, wasn't it? Charlotte's made a couple of them, and then I took on the just because I destroyed them. And, okay, uh, yeah. So um, you you become skilled at that after a while of doing loads and loads of these masks. And you had a mask and movement workshop that you did together as well. So you wear the masks and then you do all this movement together. It's very vulnerable, but it actually becomes quite, you get quite wild. I loved it. I loved mm -hmm. it so much. So uh, over to you, because uh, that's my kind of take on that time. So bring us from that kind of festival time, the Artful Badger, the Gold Hot Pants, all that stuff and <laughs> the stuff that you did with Charlotte. And I think there was a lady called Eva who was involved in that as well. I'm not sure if uh, what, yeah. what, what you'd like to talk about there. Go yeah. ahead, over to you. I'm just so yeah. excited by it. <laughs> <laughs> Sequins and glitter for sure, and yeah. masks and lots of dance and lots of great music. And 
Um, Aoife, Freddie and I um, formed a company called Artful Badger around that encounter with Charlotte and, and the music at, at actually what was called the Secret Garden Party at that point. And Charlotte made the masks for us. And we went on a long, like eight year, nine year journey of providing um, performance for events, but also putting on events ourselves, putting on parties, um, showing up at unexpected places. And I worked um, with a technique that I had found from Grotowski's training, which was this um, sort of improvised movement together in a group. Um, and I worked with that with the performers over years and years because First of all, I thought I, I saw it and thought this is a brilliant performance just in itself. Um, and so we found costumes, the animal masks, and we put them together with this um, improvised movement in in the group and um, called, called it flocking, yeah. uh, as birds do, and um, used it as a performance uh, for many festivals. And it's a roaming performance that just engages in anything and everything around it as well. Um, so the music or the or the landscape or the other or the other people around so it's really interactive and uh, and I noticed while I was doing this I noticed through the years with the performers but also during the performances that I could really see a lot first of all I could see a lot of their personalities coming out but I also noticed a lot of it changing and a lot shifting and also how amazingly we formed a group of performers. They're just, they're all still really good friends. Um, we really created a, a group of people that are, and, and that part makes my heart sing. Like I love that they're, they, you know, they're, they're having kids now and they're all traveling the world and they're, you know, a lot of them are interna international, so they're going back to different, different countries, but they're all in touch and it's a really beautiful network. <laughs> she wants to say something, don't you? Hello. She wants to be part of She's flocking with us, honey. She's flocking. <laughs> she didn't want to be down there. She wanted to be here flocking with us. Oh, hey, hey, flocky flocker. Right. <laughs> Meet the flockers. Um. <laughs> what the flock? <laughs> oh, we're here all week. <laughs> on. Um, so, um, so then I pitched this idea. I thought, when I yeah, when I graduated, I thought I want to help um, educate the the corporate communities, and I pitched this idea at a at a festival that I heard of um, that that one company that we worked with did, um, and then a, through a friend of a friend uh, took up this idea, and we went up and did the did the flocking in you know in a workshop style in kind of like a, a marketing festival where the corporates could come and, and see different was that um, learn offers. fest exactly was yeah. it oh yeah so that yeah. was through uh, our other um friend tiffany yeah and impact international yeah exactly. interesting yeah exactly and that it's it it, it worked um mm -hmm. and it definitely caught tiffany's attention and also the um you know the, the the boss of of impact was really into it and then a few of the educators were really um delighted by it um and that kind of took sarah and i on uh on a journey around the world really for a few years yeah and really opened up the, the possibility of something that i had 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 a vision of like i had seen that it was really beneficial for um just the development of um being in groups the development of well-being within the individual of finding um finding your place and, and strength and in enrollment engagement in in groups um and also opening up innovation and creativity in the person in ways that this taps into the what i was speaking of in the earlier parts of the interview is like these parts of yourself you don't even have you know like giving people the opportunity um, and the and the structure and the format to go through uh, what I call improvised movements. So not to freak out my I'm not asking you to dance. Just different sides of self come out and unexpected sides, which really opens up possibilities um, to to what can be done um, in different situations, in different companies, in in your life, in what, however you want to apply it. Really, so we had a great team that helped apply that for our um 
our workshops landing landing that information either in their company roles or in their personal lives it was really powerful yeah it takes a lot of courage I think for people to step up and do something like that and to do the movement but so much comes out of it because it's so physical and it's done in silence or it's done without the verbal channel you're really plugging into the movement channel and the gesturing channel and you have to follow and watch people and and then you know, magic can really happen, like when the magic happens, when the shift happens. And I don't want to give too much away about that, but something happens and something happens. <laughs> and it's just like, what just happened? <laughs> mm. Yeah, there are real penny drop moments as yeah. well. There's still one woman um, who I remember, she just literally, we sort of evolved in the workshop and it was near the end. So there was a lot of, there was a lot going on in the room. Uh, and she just literally stopped and I just I noticed her stop and went over and, and chatted with her and she just had this penny drop moment this just like ah oh, like kind of literally she it was like the breath had been taken away and um because I I quote find your bliss you know follow your bliss yeah yeah the, the Joseph the, Campbell you know? yeah yeah um and it's about being in the place where you're in your bliss you're in your joy and finding that you know finding the channels to get there and be there as often as possible uh which makes you the best person and the best team member possible no and um she just had this it's making my it's giving me goosebumps um penny drop moment where she was just like i i don't know how to find my group play my spot my my bliss like i don't she just she felt in, invisible and then she explained that she felt like she didn't know where she, what she was doing and how she didn't have a space and she didn't and she was this beautiful tall like proper presence in the room like she you know she she did hold a lot of space as well yeah um but she just had this moment where she realized that she doesn't she doesn't know she does you know she she was she was it, it sounds strange but it's you know no, invisible it and she didn't know she had that space and now she was in that space and it was kind of freaking her out. Like she kind of just, did, it was this moment of like, whoa. And we debriefed a lot about that afterwards. And she was just like, that was a really important, you know, things like that. Are yeah. Just real yeah. gifts from that And it, it comes from, I mean, I think in systems coaching, we call it essence. So it comes from nowhere. And it very often comes when the verbal channel's not engaged. And mm -hmm. it comes when the verbal channel's engaged as well. But when you take the words away, and you force people into their bodies because we're so up here so much and that's where we're comfortable and we can rationalize everything and you know most people who find their way into our rooms are very clever so they've got lots of language right you know and but once you take that away first of all it's very confronting and quite um it's quite vulnerable you know so oftentimes we get people to kind of make their movements larger um so we can find out what's in there so you know if somebody's kind of thinking and they're going like that be like what's that and then you get them to be do it lighter tiny fine and, and that's quite vulnerable as well right to kind of try and pull out the we call it unfolding a signal and on unfolding a non-verbal signal I think it's something very similar but you do it with the whole body well we do it with the whole body as well but it's just I would love to I, I want to work with you again mm -hmm. now I'm so like so pumped but it's just it's so incredible and you know working in a in a in a tight group like that as well a lot of stuff comes out and that was a really interesting period of time I think the last time we saw each other was in Dubai <laughs> where we, we went through maybe that is the last time we saw each other that was a pretty bonkers trip as well but um how about so tell us what happened between now and then so I didn't know you had Italian blood or maybe I did <laughs> And now you live in Italy and you're married to an Italian man with these little, little no. <laughs> multicultural little baby Italian bambinos or <laughs> um, what's what happened after that? Like, so I, be, I believe you were in some kind of choice at that time. I think there was <laughs> a yeah. couple of lovers in play, maybe, which I find utterly thrilling as well. <laughs> I don't know. I think that may be a little bit too much, but. Or, or a little bit too saucy the way that I've pitched that <laughs> or maybe there was two interested suitors <laughs> yeah uh <-huh. laughs> I had a definite choice to make which I made it a bit I, I was a bit messy with that but on all, all sides we've times forgiven that but um uh yeah I met my my husband in Italy and oh no in Italy in London Mm -hmm. And he was he was around when the Artful Badger was basically we were doing our shows in 
in the vaults underneath Waterloo Bridge, and it was where, real- where, where you were doing you were doing like performances under in the vaults under Waterloo Bridge. Yeah, beautiful. We spent three years. They came to us and said, "We've seen some of the stuff you do. What would you do if we gave you half an hour slot uh, for a performance?" And it was really close to the time, and I just said no. This is my classic. I said no to the circus, obviously, and then said no to this. And then if I just said, well, we could do, we could do this, could do this. Um, and it convinced me. And we ended up putting together shows for the, the Vaults Festival, which was just beautiful. Wow. It was just like you were talking about wild creativity, like the, what, what goes on. They still have the festival um, in those vaults uh, for, those, for that month. Um, it's it's basically like a London fringe, but the creativity and the artists and the it's just really I I miss those times. It's re- it was really exciting. It was really beautiful. That was probably another what did you call it? Essence moment? No, another yeah, maybe yeah, an essence moment where it just kind of comes up or yeah yeah, yeah gorge. Um, so we had three years of three shows, and um, I got to sort of direct and choreograph those, which. Uh, just was bliss <laughs> amazingly stressful um, yeah of course always under under uh, underfunded and and um but we got great audiences and amazing feedback and also great opportunities off the back of it so um so that was that How did we segue into that so we were doing those shows and Aaliyah was around so he met me kind of in the prime and we just started working corporate stuff as well so there was a lot of just really innovative, really exciting stuff going on. And he was just like, marry me. Um, <laughs> Love it. We had, a, we had our flat in, in East London. Um, that was an old architectural build uh, with huge windows, very similar to this house, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, and a really lovely roommate situation. And it just hit a really great... Um, well, what I didn't know was my last year in London, but really high there because we had a great, great flat, great friends, really great culture around us with all the years of, of um, performing that we'd done and, and directed. And and then he said, marry me, and he got a job. Um, he got a position with um, La Scala, which is the opera house here in Milan. He got a position as the set designer um, to come over and basically... Um, my, my <laughs> I've just been drawing on myself as well don't worry <laughs> um so he got a position offered there to do a year of apprenticeship at La Scala mm. as a set designer and I said well whatever I've been everywhere in the world why can't I go to Italy so I moved with him um and it was extremely difficult <laughs> I found it I went we went through a really dark moment um because it is the first time I moved for someone else and I didn't have my purpose here. It was his and um, and I'd left behind what I'd at that point taken for granted was this huge culture of people and resources and people asking me for work and things that I love. There was a, a mourning process there for sure. Um, in so much so that I wasn't, you know, like I said, I wasn't sure what I had gotten, what I had I'd, I'd taken, for, taken it for granted. I traveled so much and recreated and restarted my life so many times that just I just thought, yeah. well, obviously, yeah. I'll do it again yeah. and it'll be brilliant. Yeah. Um, but I was older and it wasn't for me and it wasn't, you know, it was the first time I've, I'd done that just for love. Okay. Love it. So. I would like to close, start to close out a little bit now because I can see that the baby, hey baby, <laughs> the baby's uh, wanting to start some, a change of scenery or something. I have got one question for you though. Hey, hello, hello, Aww. which is having yeah. kids and being so in your body. What, what, how did that change or alter or? What, what, how, what did that do for your relationship with your body birthing two babies? Gosh, really, really interesting question. I mean, the journey is is a miracle. The journey is just um, um, unbelievable, although it's extremely normal and extremely natural, yes. but it's, it is really unbelievable. Yeah. It happens all the time, but when it... Um, 
it's an experience of also a bit, it really unnerved me because it's the first time that I'm in a machine that is going to do something that I have no control over. Um, so this, this, you know, the body changes and things are painful and things are annoying and things are difficult and I can't use my body in the way I'm used to, you know, I, I, I guess I have used to a lot of control over my body. Right. Also, also control over when I can release the control, but like, you know, like really, um, really integrated um, relationship with my body that all of a sudden has a life of its own and doesn't really mind what I want to do or don't want to do. It's just going to do something in itself. Um, and I had, uh, I actually went in, I had a few panic attacks about that one quite intense, but I've never had panic attacks in my life. Um, but there was just a sense that I didn't have any more room when I dug into it. I didn't have any more room for myself in my body that there was this, you know, I got, I had a proper pregnant. I had a really big belly. Some women <laughs> don't, but I really had a, a full on pregnancy belly and, um, which is great. You know, my body was really healthy, did everything it needed to do. Just the miracle that, that it is, um, did what it did, what it does. And, um, and uh, I, ha I realized that I was afraid that I wasn't going to be able to live myself and my, uh, myself wasn't going to be able to live in my body. That passed and I understood the second pregnancy was, was a lot of that, the, that path had already, had already been, been, been walked. Um, what was it like being, I was really curious about the birth. I wanted to really experience a birth and see how much presence or how much, um, awareness I could bring into that experience and um so I had both my births were natural um and I'm here to say that we have a lot of evolving to do it's not a very <laughs> well designed system it's <laughs> insane so, um, so you mean evolution didn't got that quite quite badly wrong <laughs> yeah no we're, we're evolving still which is which is great we're still on the on the evolution curve because our heads are way too big and it's just wrong for the female body um i i have to say after after giving birth to olivia sole i felt like i could do anything i really had a really it was a real like um it was really strong for me i felt much more like i'm here it was a real like um, a real grounding experience to, to give birth to to Sole after after Juno, um, and uh, and I'm still feeling that. Like I think that was that. I think that's sort of a, a permanent change for me. Is there's a real mm. sense of um, of anything's again. We're coming back to the beginning. Anything's possible. Oh, I um, love it. And really living in that. Uh, and beginning to start to build back into doing some of my choreography and. And finding my way back into um, into some meaningful work for me again. Gorgeous. Meaningful. I don't want to diminish being a mother. It's brilliant. Oh no. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Amazing. I yeah. just love how humble you are in your descriptions, and I mean, like, very not modest, humble, like very straightforward. It's like you're a movement mystic in a way. That's yeah. what I kind of feel like, and you know, the way you describe things and presence and so on is so it's so I don't know that relatable is exactly the word but you make it no less and no more than it needs to be the way you tell these stories is very um um how can I say it's very straightforward it's got a lot of integrity you're not trying to make more of it or less of it and I love that I really and I'm sure that that's how how our connection came to be <laughs> Just telling the truth, but also acknowledging that there's a lot of mystic mysticism and magic in the world, but it doesn't need to mean anything more than that, unless it does. And this other thing, control over when I can release control. Wow. That's, that's profound. That's something I'm going to be having a little think about here. And back to anything is possible. And so I, my closing question for you then, Zoe, is there are many ways to lead a life. What does that mean to you? <laughs> that almost makes me want to cry actually that's really <laughs> touching um it's uh what does that mean for me um it's just really inspiring i think there's a 
there's just so much out there to be lived and um and even way beyond the wildest dreams of you know what what i could possibly imagine in my current situation um you know there's a lot to be experienced and um i love it when people get the chance or people are delivered the chance or forced to experience all these different um, manifestations of who they are or who they can be or what the world can can provide beautiful love it i love there was a bit of emotion there and i'm flocking with you (laughs) (laughs) so where can we find you i think it's on your instagram can you tell us what your instagram is I started on Instagram because I was doing a lot of flocking online during the pandemic. Um, so I started one called Flocking the Movement. Great. We'll link to that down there. It's um, Instagram and it's Flocking the Movement, all one word, at Flocking the Movement. And that's where you can find Zoe as well. And um, I'm sure you'd be able to, if you Google for the Artful Badger, you'll be able to see all the fabulous images of the uh brilliant performances and just the, a wild creativity I mean I'm in creativity at the moment but it's not wild enough at the moment I don't feel <laughs> wild at all so I'm just allowing myself to tune into your wildness tune into your baby tune into you my darling <laughs> darling Zoe thank you so much for being here on the legends podcast today Um, Thank you for listening, everybody. I believe there are many ways to lead a life and everybody has stories and I want to tell them. And thank you also to Jane Nakata for her technical um, prowess and managing this podcast and also to Laura Marushima and Angela Ortiz, (coughs) excuse me, my marketing team who work hard in the background to get these things going and also Saya Matsumoto who'll be doing the editing on this video. So thank you everybody and bye. Bye, thank you.